take? It's just one person. How two people? Three. Well, you are sort of an ISP. Uh, do you still work at ISC? Okay. Uh, how many of you do have experience with BGP? Okay, what kind of experience? Like running configuring public no and school. Sorry? School. School. Okay. Well, that is different from the, the real world. Um, well, agenda. So we have an intro, background. We'll see how the, the background of what, we, what we, we've been doing over the last few years. We'll go into details about some tools that we're using. And then um, uh, we'll talk about the streaming services. Um, so who are we? I am a RIPE NCC trainer. Uh, I, tell, I teach people about how to use IP addresses in the European region. I'm a past founder of an ISP, so um, I created it from scratch. Everything uh, configured from the first line of coding of uh, configuration from the first configuration line in the router to uh, we were doing we were configuring bank networks. And I'm involved in networking and some other projects. And uh, Amadeo is the owner and operator right now of BStreaming. He also founded an ISP in 1997, the first fully automated ISP in Italy running on BSD. He's a coder, tech, and you can see him. If you go to this website, there's a live stream from directly from Amadeo because he couldn't come over. So uh, if you type it in your web browser, you should see um, a live stream from him. Wait a few seconds until you type it. Sorry? Are you using capitals? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, he should be on the. Oh, that's. I can see him. Yeah, yeah, it's coming. There he is. It's coming. There he, there he is. Okay. I got that domain market.com, chatstreaming.com. Beef stream, wait. Chatstreaming? Beef stream. I guess that's a totally different company. Well, later. So what is, what is this about? Uh, the idea is to open up discussion for people to use open source software to drive their business. Because uh, in the networking world, when you, when you start mentioning, oh, I run a software router, and Mike knows about that, um, people look at you and they say, ah, you're, sometimes you have even problems bringing your own hardware into, into IXPs because they, they don't want that. They don't, they don't know what it is, and it's, it's a problem. I've, I found this to be a problem in my, my previous job. So what I'm trying to do, uh, what I generally try to do, is to get people to start using, uh, start using uh, software solutions to, to, to overcome problems. And we'll see why then. But so I'd like you to participate. So if you have questions, if you have uh, if you want to give me insights from your, or if you want to um, just raise your hand, talk, participate. And you can, we also set up an hashtag on Twitter. And um, there you go. So why are we doing this? Because I've seen it works. Uh, and because we're going to show our experience with it, well, a bit, some of it. And ultimately, because it's definitely cheaper than other solutions. Uh, definitely cheaper, uh, depending on what, what, how you look at it. If you look at it from from the perspective, of, from the real um, the money uh, on the money side, yes. If you look on the, on the operational side, you have to train people, and we'll see that later. What is the background? The streaming is a streaming company. It is based on FreeBSD, and for streaming, especially live, you need connectivity. So we were, uh, me and Amadeo have been friends for for many years, and we were discussing about this after I left my, my previous company. And he was telling me that he was having problems finding good connectivity in Europe for, the, for some of the streams uh, he was supposed to do. 
And then I, I came up with, with an idea. Uh, let's try to become an access ISP. We won't be discussing about the paperwork here. You know, there's a lot of paperwork involved in Europe to become an operator, to get licenses. Uh, it's different from getting a license from the um, FCC in, in the US, but it's still hard. Um, and takes a lot of effort, but um, it can become it can become a major point, a major selling point when you're trying to go to one of your customers, selling them a, a streaming service, and you come up with a complete solution. We'll bring you the uh, connection service, we'll bring you the access, and we'll also give you the, the stream. I don't know how do you scale and do you deal with this. You don't. In what what do you mean? You don't deal with. Uh, we deal with all people. Okay, but how do you? I mean, how do you deal with this when you go to your customers and when when you're asked to run a live streaming or? Sorry. So you don't do that. No. Okay. Wh why not? Because it's not it's not in your business plans. Or? Okay, okay, so you don't deal with it. Okay, perfect. Sorry for the question then. <laughs> uh, what were the goals? Uh, provide access along content. Uh, keep the costs low. So we said, okay, let's try it. Let's, let's try if it works, and then if it works, we'll get bigger hardware. We'll get more. And we, we wanted to use technology uh, we could grow with. Because the problem, and we will see it later, is that um, some of the technology you can buy nowadays will be obsolete in, 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 very, in a very short period of time. We wanted to mix up content and eyeballs. When you, when you, do, uh, when you do streaming and you're sending lots of, uh, lots of bits across uh, the networks, you're sending them out of your network. But when you, when you start doing, when you, when you, when you start doing access, you will have You'll, you, you will begin to have um, traffic coming into your network. And so you, you, ha you will have a balanced, uh, the, the goal was to get a balanced um, uh, ratio between uh, outgoing and incoming traffic so that when you, when you go to peer at an IXP, you will, have, you will get more attention from the other networks because uh, they, they won't have to deal with um, handling, handling, well, how can I put this? Uh, they will, they will more likely peer with you than, than when you're just a content network. And you will have also eyeballs for their contents. So um, if you have a balanced uh, ratio of traffic, it will be easier for them to deal with you. So how would you achieve then the, the balanced ratio of traffic if, uh, if you, know, you, you have to start small, you said you have to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, the problem is uh, when you do this, you're, um, let's say, you act, as, you act with uh, hot potato routing. So what you will do is uh, you will hand out your bits, your content bits, to the closest point uh, of peering with any other uh, network. And then they'll have to deal with bringing your bits to, into their network and bringing them to their, to their users. And that's a major deal. But when you have, so you're, you're sending more than, than receiving. And this is a cost for them. But when you, when you have a balanced uh, ratio, they will see you as a point where they can send you bits as well. And so generally, uh, let's say you, you get to an, a new internet exchange and you, you send out an email, hey, I want to peer with you guys. What generally what the answers you will get are smaller networks will say, yes, OK, we'll peer with you. No, no problem. We'll set it up. But the amount of traffic will be very low. Uh, bigger networks tend to, to tell you, hey, yes, we could peer with you if you meet the, these requirements. And the requirements generally are, I don't know, one gigabit of traffic, symmetrical, so not, not just in one direction, uh, peer uh, over multiple uh, internet exchanges in different regions of the world. So sometimes you have to be big to peer with them. Sometimes they, you can just try and tell them, hey, I have I don't know, three gigabits of traffic, but in just one region, would you peer with me? Because I see you have 
eyeballs or you have content. Um, so generally it helps if you, well, we'll see this later, if you generate graphs based uh, on NetFlow output and look at the destination and uh, origination uh, ASNs for, your, uh, for the, the traffic you generate or receive, and you show them. Hey, I have, I don't know, two gigabits of traffic coming from your network into mine, uh, but I don't have any traffic coming out of my network into yours. Would you like to peer with me at this internet exchange? So other than passing through transits, uh, we will just exchange traffic this way. So it's a matter of uh, giving them a chance to see the value in, in uh, managing a peering session with you. Because remember, if you're a big network, you will have thousands of, uh, of, of sessions to keep up unless you find internet exchanges with good and valuable route servers, which, which is a different kind of story. Do you guys know what a route server is at an internet exchange? I don't see many ads shaking. Okay, so, well, Mike knows. Um, if, you, if you go to an internet exchange, instead of peering with all the different uh, uh, entities, you will peer with just one, uh, one machine, one, one session, and you'll get all the routes from all the other participants, and then you will send traffic directly to their interfaces. So instead of having, say, 200 sessions, you will just have one, but you will receive routes for all the other participants, uh, which makes life, very, uh, life easier. For example, uh, Google only, only peers at internet exchanges with a route server, and otherwise they would have to manage thousands and thousands of sessions all the time. I don't know about that. I don't know the internals, but uh, we're not here to discuss the internals. <laughs> oh, that was just an example. Uh, so does this answer your question? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Is there any other questions so far? No. So the first steps are define a routing policy, define uh, XCON, so cross-connects uh, for XDSL services and related protocols and standards because there are a bunch of them. Define new goals for the CDI, content delivery infrastructure, and shop for vendors and or software. So uh, routing, how do, how do we think about doing it? Uh, BGP, of course. Uh, maybe OSPF as IGP, although um, we ended up with a different solution with, um, with RIP for the moment. And uh, as you can see from my t-shirt, uh, I wanted to do IPv6 from, from, the, from the, the beginning. So the idea was to begin with IPv6 and then do IPv4 on top of that. Um, what are the routing challenges nowadays? Um, the, 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 the routing table is continuously growing. It's almost touching 500,000 routes. We are 556,000 uh, at the end of this week. We, at the beginning, was 430,000. Uh, you have to be IPv6 enabled if you want to, to be future-proof. And if you want to be IPv6 enabled, well, there will be more routes to come. And it will be fun. Uh, I mean, I'm really wondering what will happen when people will start announcing slash 48 separately. Because this will mean that any, any provider in the world will, might be able to announce up to 65,000 different routes. So imagine, multiply it by the number of ASN numbers and the number of networks that are out there. So this, the problem is, with vendors, many of them, they have TCAMs, so the memory on the routers are, um, is uh, so far limited on the low-end models to 1 million IPv4 routes. So if you have more than, if, if, if the routing table goes to more than 500,000 uh, entries and you have more than, uh, more than one transit, you won't be able to store the whole routing table on your router. So you will, so the problem is it will start to save them in memory and it will be um, um, slower and slower and slower in, in lookups. And add to this the fact that you also want to have IPv6 routes, so you will also have even more. And then routing, your, your machine will just slow down. Unless you want to cash out money for Big, for higher end uh, equipment, which means, of course, getting more routes and, and getting more money out of your pockets. So how do, we, how do you solve this problem? You can use Quagga, OpenBGPD, BERT, and ExaBGP. Um, Quagga is the closer to the Cisco implementation. 
Um, the, uh, Quagga has a, has a daemon running, and then you have an interface which is very similar to, uh, to the Cisco interface. So if you have somebody who is familiar with that, it's very easy to move them from, from a, a pure Cisco router to a Quagga-based Quagga uh, router. But uh, it has way many more bugs than I would have liked to know and see uh, or to hear about. Uh, you, you constantly hear about problems in, in the Quagga base code. Even though they're fixing them, they're still out there. So I wouldn't recommend it. So OpenBGPD instead is native on OpenBSD. And remember we said we are, uh, the shop was FreeBSD based at the time. And uh, at the time, the port was lagging behind inversions on FreeBSD. And uh, the here present Mike, uh, he's denying it now, but, uh, but I asked him about, he, he was using OpenOSPFD at the time. I think it was Quagga. OpenBGPD, no, it was OpenOSPF. And he, he, he reported to me that in his network, he saw uh, strange things happening with OpenOSPFD. Open uh, even though, so even though I was already using it at Minap, uh, it's an internet exchange we have in Italy that I founded with, along with other, uh, with four other people. Uh, I didn't feel uh, comfortable using it um, because of this records, because of uh, some tests that I made internally, that which didn't didn't quite give me the expected results. So, OpenBGP is solid. Yes, is solid. it's OpenOSPFD that's uh, less solid and. Sometimes, um, sometimes it will lose state of the interface and start. So you would have you would unplug an interface and not see it going down in the in the in your internal uh, IGP. Bird was mature enough at the time. Uh, it looked promising enough to be able to handle MPLS and multiple tables. We were already using it at MENAP. We were using both uh, Bird and OpenBGP. Uh, and it also supports OSPF and RIP, so this is why we ended up using RIP um, in the end. Might be, yes. But so far I haven't seen uh, any problems. I s I any flaps or anything? No, well even with, uh, even in, uh, well yesterday, it was two days ago, we had uh, there were some Major flapping on the internet, like six million route changes in a few hours. Yeah, I didn't even notice. So just for you to know, there were reports in the last few days of um, instability on the internet. So you would get lots of lots and lots and lots and lots of updates. So withdraw routes, add routes, withdraw routes, add routes, and this uh, uh, this makes uh, your CPU usage go weary when when this happens, and there's six million changes in, in a few hours is a lot. Um, so we end up using BERT. Um, ExaBGP, uh, instead, uh, is not really a BGP daemon, it's just a toolkit. Um, the idea is to use it, was to use it for the CDN, so to do any cast, and uh, also to play with communities and uh, black holing. So, what ExaBGP does is it, it runs as a very, very, very tiny daemon but where you can originate announcements and you can accept announcements uh, and do whatever you want with them. You can script it. So we ended up uh, writing a solution where we are doing black holing. Um, so this means that we, we inject a route uh, into, our, uh, into our IGP where um, ExaBGP redistributes it into our, uh, into our border routers and uh, with a specific community telling, to, telling our border routers to null route the, the, this specific uh, IP so that if we are getting, uh, I don't know, uh, scanned from, from one of those IPs, we just black hole that and we don't receive any traffic anymore. And after some time, we just bring it back into, we, we cancel this route. Specifically, um, so XBGP works very works fairly well. You can also use it to test your BGP implementations or to test your routers because you can inject even the full routing table and have it propagated into your your system. Um, 
So let's go on with XDSL aggregation. Uh, we were doing, the, the goal was to do it in different countries. We're actually doing it in three. Uh, one standard, even across countries. So every major incumbent you can find will do L2TP. So uh, L2TP with PPPoE as, as the termination. I guess they, do, they also do it in Canada, right? Yeah. Uh, so this was quite easy. There's MPD in FreeBSD. It's easy, simple, and stable. Never had any problem with it. Our configuration is very, very simple. And if you need any help, Alexander is very, 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 very uh, is available. So you can just send, shoot him an email if you have any problem with the code or anything. We had, we actually had problems with some parts of the code. Uh, we emailed him, uh, came back with an answer in less than 24 hours, and then we worked together to fix the problem and uh, and we came up with a good solution. Um, MPD can be interfaced easily with Radius, so if you if you have users in Radius, just you can use it. You can have it look up in Radius. We also have uh, a modification to MPD. We we modified a little bit of the code to uh, to do some to tunnel again L2TP to um, um, what do you say to um, to continue to carry on the tunnel to, towards some of our customers because they we have re, uh, at one point we started having resellers so we sorry no it doesn't do tunnel switch um, so we get the call in uh, from uh, open up the LT, L2TP tunnel we do we look into the PPPoE session get uh, the username and uh, and domain based by based on the domain uh, we forward it to another well, but what we, it, we do it um, uh, dynamically looking at uh, announcements we receive via BGP. So depending on what we have in the BGP table from this customer, we, we forward it to a, seri a set of uh, other radio servers. They wanted to do it. They said, we have it already working with other implementations, and they're French. So I won't get into any more <coughs> details. So other stuff you might need. Uh, this is a just. These are uh, tips from somebody who has run a an ISP for some time. Uh, so you want an IP address management or config manager, uh, a looking glass, uh, NetFlow. Anyone? Do you, do you do a NetFlow? No. And sorry. Mm -hmm. Uh, you want some rec management software and diagnosis tools? Sure. Yep, that's into that's that's actually uh, that's what rec management means. So. Yeah, well, the idea is to label everything. Uh, people who have bigger operations might already know the, all of this, but um, uh, rec management is one side. What I, what I, how I call this. Um, uh, there are different softwares. Uh, there is, well, IPAM and Config Manager. I ended up writing my own internal solution, even for rec management and um, and cable management. So. Uh, Well, the, the thing is, when you're a bigger shop, uh, you already have something in place for this. But, um, but since we were actually... It, it, it's something that scales in the downward spiral very quickly if you don't do it right from the beginning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, so what we, the, the problem here was that we already had uh, some servers uh, scattered all over. And we started adding more uh, more equipment to to do the, actually the BGP part and uh, and uh, and the DSL aggregation. So we started needing something like this. And when you when you start adding transits, so two transits per uh, per look, per pop in different countries, then you want to start having something 
some way to know where exactly where things are. Um, yeah, of course it happens that you, you call the colo and have the wrong machine rebooted, but that still happens, but uh, it should not. Um, sorry? It does, it will happen. So uh, I recommend Subnets Manager because it does both IPv4 and IPv6. Uh, it's very easy, it's, it's written PHP, uh, sorry. Uh, I didn't write it. And if you live in the Aaron region, it can do. It can already send the um, the SWIPs directly to Aaron to register your assignments, your the assignments to your customers. Um, I'm writing to integrate the RIPE way of doing things in the in the software, but uh, not yet. Um, do you guys know what a looking glass is? Look, looking glass is. The purpose of a looking glass is to be to look into what's happening in your routers uh, or outside of your routers. You can generally run a trace route or look at the rib at the fib. Uh, if you are uh, the L LG is the de facto standard, but needs remote console access, so that means that it's based on Cisco um, Cisco gear. So it has to connect to the to the console on the Cisco gear and run comments. And if you're not running Cisco gear, you can't run it. So GIXLG is a reasonable solution. It's based on ExaBGP, so that means that you might want to have ExaBGP running on the same machine as your, as your other. Um, uh, it's based on uh, GX, uh, It's based on ExaBGP and uses MySQL as backend. So you can do. You can have ExaBGP put all the routes in, in MySQL and then look them up. NetFlow. PF flow D. I would have liked to see Henning here because he committed it a few years ago and then never touched it again. I don't know if it works. I never tried it. So actually for NetFlow, there's not much going on on, on the PSDs. So if you have any hints or ideas, I'm, I would be glad to hear about them. And sorry? Five years ago, Touch was the one that Yeah, I know. So various others are, for example, Rack Management. Um, my advice is to use Rack Monkey if you don't want to write your own because it's great. It lacks uh, actually the ability to uh, to track cabling, but you can easily you can easily manage it via some of the um, um, notes the note system it has or. Um, you can manage. You can manage it. It's still in Rack Monkey. It's not as um, it's not as good as it would do if it was written for that purpose. But still, you can do it. Smoke ping because when a customer uh, calls in and says, "Oh, my connection is not working," you want to tell them, "I see that it is working or not." Uh, MRTG cacti, depending on size or your choice, um, whatever system you want. So now I'm. I think it's Amadeus' time to go into details about the content delivery network. Let's see if that works. Can you hear him? Yes. Amadeus' time to go into Can you guys see him or want me to put him on, yes. the, on the big screen? Okay. Hello? <laughs> can, See? can everybody can, can you hear me? Yeah, they can hear you. Uh, give me okay. a second to open up. It's fine, or well. Uh, Max, can can everybody can, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Just go on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Goodness. So. <clears throat> Um, I think we have a problem with uh, the audio. I don't know. So if you need to, okay. to tell me anything, I use the keyboard. Tell me here and we'll all use the keyboard. Okay. Um, I think we have a problem with uh, the audio. I don't know. So if you need to, to tell me anything, please use the keyboard. Um, okay. 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 So um, the... While we had this uh, ISP in place with uh, multiple locations, we also thought of okay. using it to, so, um, to deliver content. 
the, so we've done a BSD based while we had this uh, ISP in place and, um, with this multiple locations it's running on BSD oh yeah obviously. because I have it to Perfect. Yeah, because it's, so we've done a so it's like streaming. Hold on, hold on. And, um, and this kind of is running on BSD only yeah. So we do everything. We do video just and then the Sorry? Yeah, we, we tried last night. Uh, uh, okay. Now just a quick... Uh, overview of um, what a CDN is. A CDN is made essentially okay. Okay, just a second. Okay, now it should be okay with the audio. Uh, now a CDN is made out of, of basically two pieces. A CDI, which is the infrastructure, what actually delivers the meat, and then uh, a content man management system that allows you to uh, decide what to deliver and how to deliver and to provide uh, uh, value-added services to, um, to the end user. So uh, what we have, uh, the first thing in network design, if you want to do a CDI today, uh, you can ask yourself, shall I make it or buy it? Uh, when we started all this back in 2006, to buy it was not really an option because there were very, very few players uh, and they were uh, sort of extremely expensive and uh, with little, if any, uh, flexibility. So it was not really an option to buy uh, um, the content delivery infrastructure from someone else. Today it is. You might have a look at uh, Cloudflare, for example, uh, also, there is some other services uh, from Amazon, at least to, uh, for the basic delivery um, service. Uh, I think if you want to do a CDN as a business, uh, so if your core business is CDN, you need to run your own CDI. Um, otherwise, you're, you're just a sort of uh, reseller of for someone else's services. So you have different options if you want to make your own CDI. Go for a single server. Now, this is, of course, an option, but um, it's, it's not a, a real one because you want to, to the, the real reason to have CDIs is to reduce the number of hopes and to deliver the bits as close as possible to, to the end users. Um, <clears throat> Also, you, you might consider a single delivery center, which is more or less the same thing. Um, so don't go for it. What we do, we have multiple delivery centers. And uh, that's what we are uh, we will uh, talk about. So, um, okay. The first thing, you need to find a way, a technical way, to make sure that... Uh, the end users can reach the closest uh, available version of the content that they're looking uh, for. And so you have different options. The, um, um, we, we use, we can, you can use either an IP uh, routing, so that uh, using routing, BGP basically, um, you can uh, direct the, the, the user to, your, to the closest uh, available servers or you can use DNS. We've been using both, and uh, definitely uh, the routing option is, uh, is the best one. Uh, everything, again, based on, uh, uh, on um, a BSD solution. Uh, the second element that you need, uh, you're doing really a network over the network, because you need to be able to, to reach and to deliver uh, seamless content uh, across your network, your servers. So um, you can either do it uh, role to say so, so you go on the internet, or maybe for some services you might need uh, an open VPN or an IPsec solution. Uh, beware of uh, uh, layer two or layer three services that you might buy around, they call it VPN as well. Uh, I do not recommend layer three services because they don't add anything uh, they, they might also be slower or uh, less reliable 
than uh, as a standard internet connection. Uh, we use OpenVPN to, to send, uh, for example, accounting information or uh, content um, lo uh, localization. You, you know the uh, location. Um, you know the, you need these um, because you need to be able uh, to have local information. I mean that, um, and also local content. Every distribution center need to know everything about all the content that needs to be distributed, I mean, where it is, how to locate it, and also need to have the information um, about accounting, for example, uh, and, uh, for example, if you want to disable a certain uh, user or a certain content, uh, the information from our point of view needs to be locally present and replicated and distributed in every distribution center. You don't want to keep it centralized. So, uh, because of, uh, of course, if you have a failure somewhere, you uh, you need to be able to, to, to continue uh, the service. <coughs> Now, uh, for content delivery infrastructure, you need a, a, a software. The, the hardest part is, is to find a streaming solution, a video and audio streaming solution. Today, uh, you basically have three uh, options. You can read them here, Red5, Woza, and, uh, and Adobe Flash, uh, Flash Media Server. They're all Java-based, so you can run them on uh, on any standard uh, BSD platform with uh, Java enabled. Uh, Red5 is open source and free. Uh, on the other hand, it only provides delivery to RTMP, which means flash, um, uh, flash devices. Uh, the other two are more or less the same thing. Adobe, possibly uh, a little more expensive, and Moza, uh, is the one we use because uh, it's not that expensive and it, it offers a, a higher number of delivery options. For example, you, you can stream to to mobile devices and the like. Uh, HTTP, if you need to deliver HTTP, that's very basic. You use your preferred web server. Maybe you need to uh, write your own. Uh, I mean, in both cases for streaming and HTTP, you need to write your own accounting solution. So. Uh, uh, when you run a CDN, basically you sell bits, so you need to make sure you count how many bits go out to uh, to be your clients. And also, you need to write plugins for uh, for these streaming services or application or whatever you call them uh, to to make sure uh, it uh, you're able to uh, to locate the content, uh, which server and uh, which uh, distribution center it is in. And then to, to provide a number of value-added services. We will come back later about the value-added services that you can, you can do. Uh, coming to the uh, content management system, uh, many people say, okay, that's the easy part. If you've done the, the content infrastructure, uh, content management is the easy part. Um, I don't agree completely in the sense that it is easy if you want to make just the basic things. Um, it can become a little bit challenging if you want to deliver, especially for the value added services that we'll see in a moment. Uh, anyhow, you need to <coughs> choose your uh, web development platform because a CMS is usually based on, on the web. Uh, you might be willing to, to write an API uh, via web services or whatever other solution. Uh, Want to use and integrate it with your uh, content delivery infrastructure. You need to keep an eye on accounting so that uh, accounting information is available available via the content management system. And and then you need to handle uh, publishing. When uh, when we talk about video uh, streaming, usually people have the idea of a sort of YouTube where you automatically, whenever you upload something, it's automatically, you can you can view it, everybody can view it. You, you just copy and paste um, a URL to your friend and they can see the video. Now, we decided to split a little bit the publishing uh, from the from the uploading. So, uh, you're responsible to, to publish the, um, the content on your own. This is a sort of uh, big difference because we focus mainly mainly on uh, uh, 
B2, um, uh, B2C market, not, mm, we don't go directly to, to the end user. So you want, for example, to be able to have a white label uh, services that uh, you want to rebrand, or maybe you want to show that your company has no relationship with, with our streaming uh, platform. So uh, the, the publishing is, is left aside. Uh, the value-added services, here I mentioned a few. You can do multi-conference with streaming. Uh, streaming can, can be um, unidirectional as it is now, or it can be also um, bidirectional. Now, if you multiply with, uh, with many users, you, you can do multi-conference. Multi it's a little bit tricky. It's not that easy, and, but it, still it's possible to do it. For example, also you can do content tagging. We we made a, uh, we've been using content tagging with a client of ours, and they have a lot of videos, so you, they need to be able to organize them so, somehow. Access control, for example, let's say that you want to uh, allow only invited people to see your video, and maybe content encryption because you maybe you want uh, not um, your uh, uh, your delivery sensible videos, for example, meetings or things like that, then you want to use uh, encryption. Uh, now, one of the uh, toughest part, and uh, with this I'm about to complete this um, um, uh, short speech about uh, streaming, uh, how to do content preparation. Now, content preparation is uh, when you have videos, or I mean, generally speaking, when you have content, but the hard part is to, to deal with video and with audio. So the minimum tools that you need to use is uh, JPEG, FFmpeg, and Player, and GStreamer, which is not mentioned here. Um, uh, you you want to to be um, um, to be an expert with these tools because. Uh, you always need to convert, transform. There, there is no real defined standards in, uh, in the video streaming industry. And uh, many uh, new standards pop up uh, continuously. So you need to sort of convert and make sure you can, you can transcode or adapt the, the video for, uh, for video streaming. Uh, now, if you if you use FreeBSD, you might be willing to have a look at uh, uh, user ports multimedia and user ports audio. There is uh, a lot of stuff that, that that is very useful. And then, uh, if you want to do cool stuff with videos, um, you should really be using user ports multimedia MLT. Uh, this is allows you to write scripts uh, that can. Uh, add effects to a video, merge videos together, uh, show things uh, popping up and down in, in the video, change the audio, make effects, and, uh, and the like. So it's really a powerful tool. And <clears throat> the, last, uh, um, the last slide is about the, the script that is running this, uh, uh, this conference. It's running on BSD. It uses standard stuff. We've been now I'm using a, a camera connected to uh, to a laptop with a firework cable. Uh, I'm making a copy of it so you can see the T command. I'm making a copy of the video so if I want to work and use it afterward. And then I'm encoding live with FFmpeg to directly to into our ingest. Uh, in just point. And that's it. And now, should you have any questions, please ask them to Massimiliano, and Massimiliano will type them for me. Are there any questions? How are you guys handling the bribes then? I'm hearing that you're, uh, you're just centralizing, so uh, you normally what you do is buy the hashes on edges so that you get popular content. Okay, wait, because it's somebody else. So, uh.
Oh, yeah. But he's... <coughs> Well, uh, you need to to define the edge because the edge of the internet is, uh, uh, as far as I understand, is not a unique place. <laughs> it depends on how you define the edge. So um, the edge is where we have a content uh, delivery, uh, um, content distribution center. Uh, that's what we call the edge. Now, uh, we don't have a centralized structure. So, for example, when you um, upload a, a video on the... Uh, yes, okay. Uh, when you upload the, a video to, via the content management system, it is uh, automatically um, distributed um, to all the uh, uh, content distribution centers. Now, what happens if um, if the content is not uh, requested for a period of time? It might get delete, be deleted on uh, on some uh, content distribution centers, and then um, we know how to locate it. And if it is requested again, we copy it again, we send it again to the to the content distribution system. And how do we do? How do we handle this? We, this is something we had to write, and we we had to do on on our own. It's um, it's based on FUSFS. Fuse okay. Yeah. Okay. So um, we'll go on with some final considerations, which are mostly related to the um, to the networking part, and less a little less about the. Um, the, um, the streaming part. So it's beware. Uh, while it might be easy to set up, you have to maintain this kind of environment, which means you need to have knowledgeable people. One of the challenges that I found at my previous job was that uh, we had uh, I, I had some um, some employees who were networking guys, and I told them, okay, let's let's implement this. Uh, um, software routing system and they were scared about it because they didn't know where to start from because they had never seen a, a Unix console or whatever and so uh, that was a major challenge in trying to implement this and this is um, actually also one of the reasons why why I, I had to uh, well this is one of the reasons why at the end I decided just to just to leave um, yeah I'll even sell my shares of the company uh, so many networkers know Cisco and Juniper and maybe a little bit of Microtik, but they don't know Unix. They don't know anything. They don't want to. They don't. They don't have the the, the knowledge or the, the the need to go to to get to know that because they'll just they, if you if you tell them to go learn this, they will just switch up to another job. And th this is something you want to keep in mind. And BGP is a threat. Well, you could be a threat to the internet. So you have to know what you're doing when dealing with BGP. So who designed it? Uh, whoever designed it thought that uh, you have to be knowledgeable to run it. Uh, you can do a, a great deal of damage to the whole internet if you, when you're when you're running BGP. So take for example the YouTube against Pakistan telecom incident. Somebody started to in somebody in Pakistan started to announce the YouTube prefixes, and so all, all the traffic directed to YouTube went to Pakistan instead of going to YouTube directly. Or newbies playing around with Microtik uh, instead of doing they they created a an IS path of 256 um, um, entries and they tickled the bug in uh, in, um, in, a, in all the other Cisco routers all over the world and sessions all over the world were flapping around and it took some a while to figure that out for the whole internet so there were messages emails going back and forth to between people all day. Sorry? They were newbies in Microtik yes. and didn't want to run, didn't want to read the manual. So, and so on. There, there are incidents like these uh, pretty much every day. Uh, some have uh, a smaller influence on the internet, some have a bigger one. And yes, we showed it as possible. Now it's up to you. And one of the things I'd like to highlight is. Um, if you run, if you have a network, if you have an ISP, you want one of these probes to to be in your network, so, because they're 
This is a project from the RIPE NCC to monitor the internet. So if you want one, just let me know and I can, I can ship you one from my office. So you can install one of these probes at home in your uh, office network and you can monitor the, uh, you can use them to monitor the, the whole internet from there. Or you can, you can use, you can use a, you can, you can play with one of these probes and get points uh, using them to run your own test measurements against your own network. So if you want to say, I have 500 probes all over the world, ping one of your IP addresses to see the reachability, you can do that from the, from the Atlas website, or you can, you can run any, any other kind of measurement. So it's, uh, for now you can only do ping, trace route, and DNS lookup, but it's going to become a, a toolbox to uh, run your own measurements on um, uh, world effort. Worldwide. Do you have any other questions? No questions. We were either. I just uh, was looking at some of the technologies that you're mm -hmm. using, um, and just from what I've read, it seems, yeah. um, and from putting two together, it seems like a lot of the technologies you're using, or some, if not most, are the same that are integrated into ISP to space. Am I correct? Um, with the exception of some of the You mean for the um, for the um, streaming part? Of, well, ISP config is more for uh, it's more suitable for uh, hosting web, hosting sites. Yeah. So that I didn't get into that detail because I was mostly focusing on the access part. But yes, some of, most of that is. Well, I didn't get into the uh, web server side of the of the operations, but web server or email or whatever else side of the operations. But yes. But even the accounting. Mm -hmm. uh, some of those yes, well, the, well, DNS. When you do access, you want you just generally manage only reverse DNS with your customers. And um, again, I ended up writing my my own uh, software. It, it was actually integrated into the IP address management software, where customers could just log in and see their IP addresses and set up the reverse DNS. It's trivial, actually. It's very, very, very trivial. So. Yes, I didn't get into that detail because I was focusing more on the routing part, but yeah. yes, it's, it's mostly standard software. Yeah. Apart from, um, well, BGP is yeah. pretty much widely, widely available. So yeah, so for, for the rest is pretty much common. So any other question? Do you, do you build on, on the transit for transit? Yeah, no, not the transit. At transit, we do 95th yeah. percentile to well, we have some co-location customers, and we do 95th percentile on them. Uh, MRPG. Sorry? Yeah. yeah. We're not very strict because actually, um, as again, we go back to the content versus eyeballs. Uh, content and eyeballs. If you if you keep, if you keep a good balance between outgoing and incoming bandwidth, you don't want to care about what your customers are really doing. I mean. Well, you still have to keep an eye on that, yeah. but, but you're not so strict. Um, unless you really want to charge them based on each and every megabit that they're doing, um, there's no reason to do that. So, so far, no, we, we, we do it, just look at the graphs at the end of the month and that's it. Yeah, and then unless they're going faster, it's the same thing. Yeah, yeah it's the same thing. Unless, unless they're, they, they're they bought like 10 megabits of uh, transit and, they, and then they do 20 or 25, well, then yes. But we generally send them an email, tell them, hey, this month you did uh, this percentage more than you should be allowed. And then, are you guys comfortable with 95th percentile, how it works? No. Okay, so uh, basically you run MRPG and you, and you, um, you get a sample of the traffic every five minutes. So you, uh, at that point, you know how much traffic has been passing by on that, uh, on that interface. And at the end of the month, you discard uh, the highest 5% of those, uh, those readings, and then you get the average out of that. So you see that on, on average, your customer has done, I don't know, 20 megabits, uh, and you discard the 5% uh, higher um, readings. So that means that he can do, for 36 hours a month, he can do, say, if he bought 
10 megabits of transit over a uh, 100 megabit uh, port, up uplink port, they can do 100 megabits for 36 hours a month. Um, which means that uh, if they have spikes or if they, if they want to do, I don't know, advertisement campaigns, they can still do them and not be built for them. And while you, while you might have big, big spikes on your network, you can still be assured that if they do more, uh, if they use more traffic, then, then they will get built. Or you can build. Sorry? Exactly. Exactly. So, Spike, as long as it's no more than 30 hours, it's but what, what generally happens is that I don't know some, some of the customers will pay for, say, 20 megabits, and then in the 95th percentile, they do 21 on average. And you don't want to start billing them for 21. You just play the good, the good part and send them an email and say, hey, you know, you've been doing 21 megabits. And then you might think about getting 25 of transit instead of just 20. And but it happens rarely because, well, either you are proactive or um, when you have both content and, and access on, your, on the same network, you can, if you start having a lot of access, you can start actually uh, giving content bandwidth away for free. Or you can start playing with it, like using it as a commodity to uh, encourage customers to stay with you. Bec Sorry? Yeah, some cost because you're you, uh, you always pay for uh, for uh, bandwidth in both directions. So you will if you're if you're having access and you have uh, 30 megabits of traffic for your access uh, network, you will have 30 megabits getting to your network, and then you will still not you might not still be sending too many bits out of your network. So if you if you get colocation customers and you and they will start sending bits out of your network, that's bandwidth you're already paying for. And then you can start play with it uh, from, from a sales perspective, like mm, selling it for very cheap. <laughs> okay, so it's the end. Thank you for being here.